So we have to live with the absolute. And so there's this notion of, yes, of course. Good to meet you. Likewise. Bye -bye. Oh, right there she is. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Pakistan Pivot. Today we have a very, very special guest with us uh, who is the former ambassador of the United States to Pakistan, uh, Mr. Cameron Munter. So thank you so much for being part of the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to start this conversation with just sort of trying to understand, you know, Pakistan and the United States have had a very turbulent relationship over the past few decades and particularly, um, you know, pertaining to the wars that happened in Afghanistan in the, in the 80s and then in the early 2000s. Um, somehow, U.S., it seems like the U.S. has always seen Pakistan through sort of this Afghanistan prism. And the Pakistani government more recently have been talking about, you know, having a relationship beyond uh, you know, the whole Afghanistan situation, do you think there is a real possibility of that happening, particularly in the context of how the U.S. views Pakistan? Um, well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to speak, and it's really a pleasure to be back in Pakistan among friends. Thank you. Um, you know, this is a, a, a complex problem that has to do in many ways with when you say the U.S. thinks. What does the U.S. think? From the government-to-government -government point of view, you're right, we've had a turbulent number of decades where many people have said we've had an up and down kind of relationship where, uh, you know, both sides have felt betrayed by the other, where the American government has felt that it's been used by Pakistan. Pakistan feels it's been uh, abused by the Americans, etc. And these are well-known kinds of questions. And as you rightly say, they very often have to do with security. The way that I think the United States can get past, or, or at least cope uh, the United States and Pakistan can cope with this problem, is by uh, what I hope would be less of a focus on security issues and more of a focus on what I think is more intrinsically uh, the healthier part of the Pakistani-American relationship. And to me, that is the kind of relationship that involves institutions like universities, uh, businesses, uh, civic organizations, nonprofits. That is to say, Pakistani society, and American society, where there's great affinity. So when you say the U.S., yes, I, I'm sad to say I think the U.S. government and the Pakistani government are going to continue to have issues uh, around security, around the future of Afghanistan still, on the relationship Pakistan has to India, etc. But where I am most optimistic is that there are other parts of both of our societies where there is enormous potential. Right. Makes a lot of sense. And just sort of following up on that, um, you know, when we talk about the, the U.S. government, particularly, you know, with the Biden administration, uh, we've seen, a, you know, a, a couple of mixed signals in terms of, you know, Biden has still hasn't called, uh, you know, Prime Minister Imran Khan. Uh, but also we've seen NSA level talks happening. And then we saw that, you know, Pakistan did get an invitation for the democracy summit, albeit a little late. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the the Biden administration, you know, in in its in terms of how they look at Pakistan, what's going on in their minds? Well, you raised a very important point that uh, I felt even when I was ambassador here, that uh, was a uh, a problem in the relationship, and that was the tendency for the Americans over the last twenty years to look at Pakistan through what we called the the Afghan lens. But you can even say that even during the Cold War earlier. You might even say that Pakistan in the 1950s and 60s, Americans looked through the Russian lens. Right. Or So in other words, there is this problem that there has been a kind of a, uh, a refraction, a, an, an unclear picture of Pakistan. What I hope, and I think most friends of Pakistan in the United States hope, is that there can be a way to make a clearer, a clearer picture of the country. Sadly, what you cited, that is the questions about... about um, uh, you know, uh, diplomatic ties and, and the contacts that we've had. I'm afraid that I believe that the uh, changes that have taken place, the, the uh, events in, in Afghanistan and a number of other worldwide events still have not placed Pakistan in the center of the focus of American policymakers. Um, and so I think optimistically, I would say it's up to others to put it into the middle. Right. It may happen. It may be a, there may come a point where both the leadership of Pakistan and the leadership of the United States can deal with each other on a more clear basis. I think the way to that is through having the already strong ties we have in society build up and give opportunities for our government rather than waiting for our governments to give the opportunities to us. Right. And so just to sort of 
uh, hit that again um the us government right now at this point is at this point in time is not really looking at pakistan as a very sort of warm ally as it once used to do before no i think that at this point uh, the most uh, american leaders uh, are feeling uh, terribly disappointed by what has happened in afghanistan in afghanistan and see that the pakistani role in the war they see it very negatively now there's plenty of arguments that go back and forth about who let whom down but suffice it to say that at this point until the reverberations of afghanistan are clear i think we're still going to see primarily american focus on afghanistan when they're talking with pakistan right makes sense and um you know you mentioned the afghan prism and then you also mentioned the russia prism uh, you know back in the 50s and 60s and so particularly when it comes to this region and i feel like it's all over the world as well over the next few decades we're going to see a china prism um very you know, definitely yes. and 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 so pakistan has a very close relationship with china how much do you think that's going to affect um you know the way the us in the coming years sees pakistan there will be a tendency to see uh, pakistan kind of in a simple sense as a friend of china and in as much as the americans are focused on the indo pacific uh organizations for if security like the quad the new uh the new efforts uh, to work in the western pacific with australia and japan inevitably there is going to be an association of pakistan with china people who look a little deeper people who go away from that surface will realize that pakistan uh, is a much more complex place and that pakistan's relationship with china as those of us who watch it it's not a uh, it's not a simple kind of alliance you know it's something that has its own difficulties and 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 challenges so that i think people in the future who are trying people in the united states who are trying to have an accurate picture of pakistan will try to draw some distinction between simply saying oh pakistan ally of china that's certainly what i hope but there will be in the in the years to come as america and china if the american chinese tension increases it will certainly have an impact also on pakistan as well right and 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 you know you said some certain people will be able to sort of understand that pakistan or rather look at pakistan more independently i want to connect this with the next question where you know we've seen a certain policy shift from you know some of the most important voices in pakistan including the prime minister and the chief of army staff where we sort of moved away from geo you know geo strategic importance to geo economic importance and they've been echoing that um, you know very very regularly over the last year um do you think the us government views this as as mere rhetoric or 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 do you think they're looking at it as a very sort of concrete change in direction and do you think that this change in direction could potentially impact and i've i've, I've heard you mention this earlier as well you know uh, a change in the way that the us views pakistan m- maybe more in, in terms of partnerships around society around culture around around businesses um it's very hard for me to say and i don't mean to duck your question i've been out of government now for nearly a decade so when you say is the government thinking of pakistan in a certain way i'm really talking about my ideas rather than what the government thinks that said i still think that the overwhelming uh focus on pakistan in the united states government is through the security right uh, and it will take time for uh that to broaden to what i consider a healthier and more more complete relationship i think frankly that's not necessarily going to come from the political leadership making a decision it's going to become because of their opportunities lend themselves make themselves clear to the leaders of the united states and to the leaders of pakistan let me give you an example or two let's say for example people in the united states become more acquainted with pakistan through tourism right then you all of a sudden will maybe have more uh, american students who want to study at a pakistani university now we always have pakistani students who are looking at american universities what about coming the other way building relationships getting used to the way that things work and all of a sudden there is i don't mean to call universities businesses but there's good business in trying to have uh, you know Texas A&M University uh, work with lums uh, to try to work on specific issues then when businesses get involved when pakistan is perceived as being more of an open country businesses who are there talk to other businesses and they say here is a place where we've invested we've done well and it's worth it for us to work with you to bring you in now a lot has to happen 
before that before that time. We have to be sure that the situation here in security is better. It's markedly better than when I was here 10 years ago. Right. But this has to become clear to people in the States. Similarly, for investors, the reputation of Pakistan is, mm, it's a difficult place to invest. Well, some people have been successful here. How have they been successful? How do you communicate that home? This is a long-term process that I don't think is what a president or a prime minister can decide. Right. They, however, can see the results if these other institutions do it. So in my mind, the way forward for America and Pakistan would be at this incremental level, hoping that our leaders follow. Right. And do you think that for the investors and the businessmen, you know, Pakistan makes a good case study because we're the sixth largest country in the world. You know, we have a huge youth population. I think it's one of the one of the last remaining big markets um, that, that still has a lot of growth potential, particularly in terms of consumer markets, uh, particularly as, you know, uh, over the next few decades, it's the decade of Asia, a lot, a lot, a lot of people mm -hmm. say, right? And in terms of getting a lot of new consumers, Pakistan potentially is a very, very strong market and, and seems like a very sort of enticing opportunity. Um, but somehow it hasn't come under the radar of the American investors as well as the American businesses. Um, what do you think, how, how would you perceive it when particularly in the context of these American businesses and investors? Um, let's divide up American and businesses and investors. I think there's a lot of excitement in the United States about the potential in certain areas like tech, right. IT, and this. You've got good engineering schools. You've got young people, quite a few young people, many tens of millions of young people who are educated in the basics of what you could call the modern modern economics, the new economy. Um but let's not forget that most of Pakistan has economy that, for a lot of reasons, is held back. That is to say, if you are in uh, manufacturing, if you are in more traditional agricultural areas, and you look at Pakistan, you see a country that is, frankly, uh, not doing as well as it could or should uh, to modernize. You have, for example, in America, you can buy textiles of great quality, that are made in Pakistan, but you and I know that textiles are a so-called low-value added industry. This is something that if you become the best in the world in textiles, you're still at the low end of value added. Obviously, smart Pakistanis and, and, and forward-thinking Pakistanis would like to say, how do we build, like many other countries seek to build, into these higher level uh, areas? So there are, there are people in the United States interested in partnering and investing, especially in tech, but tech is still only a small sliver of what your economy is. For your for this to become attractive for a bigger part of the American investors, bigger part of the American economy, there would have to be some very fundamental reform. And again, you know, Americans are famous for coming and waving their fingers and telling other people how to reform when we realize we have some very important reforms to do as well. But there are things here that need to be done in order for most of the economy to show anywhere near its real potential. Right. I feel like, you know, a lot of conversations I've had with, with government officials within Pakistan, um, when they look at what their relationship with, the, with China and with the US, there's a lot of this idea that we do have to grow economically. Um, and, and when they look at, you know, US dealing with Pakistan, exclusively on a security lens, whereas China, you know, sort of dealing with Pakistan in terms of building, you know, transport infrastructure, energy infrastructure. A lot of these people feel like the U.S. is pushing us towards China, you know. Um, do you think when it comes to projects like CPEC, there is an opportunity for the Americans to essentially create a balance in the region by by partnering with Pakistan rather than looking at Pakistan as someone who is going away, the one that got away sort of? Yeah, it's a good question. I think <clears throat> I think that America in the past wanted on a much smaller scale through its assistance programs, building Tarbella Dam, doing other kinds of things. You know, the Americans did want to actually work in that area uh, to build infrastructure. What the Chinese are offering is uh, extremely large and extremely needed. I mean, there's no doubt you need these power plants. You need these highways. You need these pipes. I'm not sure that uh, this is somewhere where the Americans can easily uh, take part, mainly because of the governance, the way that the Chinese run these, these, uh, th these projects, very opaque, uh, very, uh, very much focused 
if I may say so, on the need for Chinese uh, business to export its uh, export labor, its its export goods, and that is to say, this is this is not a project uh, necessarily built with all of the inputs that the Pakistanis would like. I'll put it that way. So. If it were done a different way, I think every American who thinks about this country would agree that this kind of infrastructure is needed. Right. The way it's being done is distressing for those of us who worry, for example, about the weakness of the Pakistani financial situation and the so-called debt trap that could come out of the out of, out of CPEC. Um, and so that second question, not not that it's necessary, but working and being part of it be very hard for any Western country to do. That said, I, uh, I think that in what the uh, CPEC and the broader Belt and Road Initiative has done is it's wakened, that wakened, for example, the Europeans with their new gateway project that they're putting together. They've realized this is something that's important, and especially in countries that are traditionally friendly, like the countries like Pakistan, or even some of the countries in Central Asia and elsewhere, um, the Western countries should s compete. They should come out here and say, yes, it would be good in everyone's uh, interest to, to, um, to invest in infrastructure. But um, I think what's happened now is that the difficulties of uh, absorbing CPEC uh, are uh, making the Americans, Americans who are friends of Pakistan, a little concerned. Right. Um, this this question is going to go beyond sort of Pakistan, just for just for an understanding of how you view you know the changing global dynamics. But mm -hmm. a lot be, a lot is being said about you know a, a unipolar world to a multipolar world. Um, at this point in time, how do the average Americans you know view the entire Asian region? What do you how would you mm -hmm. summarize that? What's your opinion on you know because in the seventies till yeah. till the early two thousands there was this entire you know post pan Islamic movement. Uh, there was this idea of, uh, you know, real focus on the Middle East, a lot of terrorism happening, and then the war on terrorism following up. But now a lot of that is being subsided, and, and a lot of this focus is shifting towards China in particular. Um, so, so what's the thought process now? It's, it's, you're asking a very, very broad question, and so I try to figure out how to, how to grab it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the unipolar world was never quite as unipolar as people thought. I think the multipolar world is not going to be quite as multipolar as people think. That is to say, uh, American, uh, uh, the American role is going to be different than other countries. Take, for example, the dollar as a reserve currency. Right. Until that ends, it's going to make the American role simply different than other countries. And uh, think of the size and the structure of the American military. It's it's even though you know there are very significant militaries in Russia and China, it's still by far the hugest and most extended military. That is, there are things about America that are going to be different for many years to come. What America is trying to come to grips with is the fact that after 1990, because our focus had been on the Soviet Union, there was the so-called unipolar moment. The notion that somehow uh, most most uh, obviously stated by the people we identify as neocons, the people who were many of the people who were around the, uh, the government of George W. Bush, that the natural state of countries, when you get rid of distortions, the natural state of countries is somehow to be something like the United States, you know, and you know, all of a sudden, you know, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa will turn into Oregon, and mm -hmm, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm being silly, but you know, it was, yeah. there was some of this. I think Americans have realized from the mistakes that we made in the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan um, that uh, th this is not so simple and that there are many roads that different countries are going to take and that there is going to be, for lack of a better word, this great power competition brought about by, uh, especially by the rise of China, and that China is different. It's not a replay of the Cold War where the Americans are facing down the Russians. Uh, it's a, the whole relationship with China is utterly different than it was with the Soviet Union. Americans are getting used to this, and it's taking a long time, and I would argue that the domestic problems in America are a result of the democratic churn that comes as you try to understand your place in the world. You can say America was a very successful global economy, except that the impact of the global economy on our domestic politics 
has led to, and among other things, the kind of populism that we've seen over the last couple of years. So we're still coping with that domestically, and most Americans who are looking at foreign policy are looking at it much more through a domestic lens, if you will, than they did in the past. So the American understanding of what's happening in the world is really predicated on America's understanding of how these changes changed our own country and how are we going to be dealing with the rest of the world. In my time as a diplomat, I really never anticipated that there would be this kind of battle going on, the democratic battle in the United States. But it means that the clarity of American policy is really affected by the problems within the United States. And I always tell my friends from foreign countries, if you want to understand American foreign policy, if it seems inconsistent, take a look at American domestic policy and see the problems that are there. That'll give you some clues about why the foreign policy is inconsistent. And so most Americans are not happy with the way that international adventures have gone in the last 20 years. I don't think you're going to see American um, uh, stationing of major troops uh, anywhere around the world. No one wants to do that. Democrats, Republicans, no one. But what do they want? Do you think there is a rise in authoritarianism all over the world, particularly post-COVID? Uh, you know, even within democracies, we've, we've seen the system now going towards, uh, mm -hmm. away from the, the, the free democratic setup that the Americans have talked about for a very, very long time, mm -hmm. and towards a more authoritarian way of governance. Uh, a lot of people are seeing, you know, the way that China handled COVID and the way that a lot of Middle East handled COVID uh, as a successful model of governance. Um, and, and, and so, you know, in the context of the recently held democracy summit by, by uh, you know, President, President Biden, what do you think the Americans are thinking in terms of the rising authoritarianism in the world? It's a, it's a very uh, complex question, and overwhelmingly, what is the feeling in the United States is that many, thing are, many things are happening at once. So there is a, to begin with, there is a flood of changes going on, economic, politically, militarily, etc. So that is the, oh, the, the background. The atmosphere is that there are many things going on at once. Specifically on the question of authoritarianism, I would state it a little differently. I would say that what the argument is, is there's an argument about the ability, uh, the efficiency of government. Who gets the job done? Right. And there was, I think, an assumption that the Americans liked and that the Americans gave certainly in the years after the fall of the Soviet Union, but even before, that the American model is not only good because we believe in democracy and these kind of things, but it works best. We made that argument, it works best. Why do we have better things in our stores? Why are our people freer and happy? We are great because it works best. Now, what happened was, and I think this began in earnest, uh, after the uh, crisis of 2007 to 2009, the financial crisis, but has has found its way through in the last years, is arguments made by, you could say, authoritarian governments or other kinds of governments, maybe the American way isn't the most efficient, whether it's dealing with COVID, whether it's dealing with income inequality, whether it's dealing with any number of things. And I think the argument has come up uh, much more, uh, even though it's couched in terms of democracies, it's also couched in the question of who, who, who's best at running countries. And this is a, a, a tough one because there is a certain efficiency in having an authoritarian system. You don't have those pesky things like, you know, parliamentary debates and people disagreeing with each other and stuff like that. The the uh, argument that I think is compelling on the part of democracy and that came out through the Democracy Summit is that the structures of democracy, however uh, flawed they might be, allow for a sustainability of success that an authoritarian uh, uh, government fundamentally doesn't have, a flexibility that it doesn't have. When you have people being elected leader for life, you have someone who is likely not to be able to change with as, as the as the country changes, you have someone who's there for a very long time. And this is the story of authoritarian governments: is that they may work in certain ways for a while, but can they sustain it? 
So this is the argument that is coming up now. Does it seem like there are more authoritarian governments? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, when you look at Freedom House Index of Free Countries, the numbers are going down. The question is just whether the sustainability of the alternative is going to work. What do you do in China when you have a demographic crisis? What do you do in China when you have a debt crisis? What do you do, etc., you know, when, when these things come? Do you have the flexibility with a one-party state to deal with them? Or does the idea of democracy, messy as it is, give you a chance to solve these issues? This is the debate, I think, that's going on. Whether or not the democracy summit was a success, and I have mixed feelings about the Democracy Summit. I think that articulating the idea that there is a system that is seen by most countries as the most fair system uh, is still, I think, an important thing to do. Uh, and I read quite carefully the statement by the Pakistani government in announcing that it wouldn't take part. Uh, it was not a hostile statement to democracy. And I think that Pakistan, for all of its faults, aspires to democracy you know the question is only how you get it done and in an elective country if you don't deliver for people if you have load shedding if you have uh inflation if people aren't going to vote for you right you know so democracy as i think it's winston churchill who says you know other than every other system that's there it's the worst system except for any other thing that's there right <laughs> some 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 variation on that right yeah. um Touching up on democracy, particularly, you know, we saw uh, we also a documentary recently, The Social Dilemma, where, you know, technology has profound effects on democracy, particularly in, in, in creating a lot of polarization. And you touched upon that earlier on as mm -hmm. well. Um, you know, we saw between the President Trump's presidency, um, a lot of this aggression within the United States of two very separate groups having very separate ideologies. And it seems like, you know, for the longest time when we looked at the United States, we saw a certain level of unity within that uh, country, uh, irrespective of whatever, you know, differences they had. There was a there was a way there was a system through which they would, um, you know, walk through that those differences and be able to create a very sort of strong, robust system. Um, it seems like in the new modern world of technology, the the way that democracy functions with all of this access to information with a lot of these algorithms you know uh working around us that democracy might be the biggest threat to democracy in my opinion uh would be the the, the technology uh that's making people really sort of polarized and 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 it seems like year on year uh there are there is more heat in, 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 in all of these nations, including mm -hmm. the, United States, in the United States. How do you see the future of democracy, uh, particularly in the context of, again, uh, technology in terms of, you know, Russian intervention potentially, the ones right. talked about in, in the last elections? Uh, enormous question. It's probably the biggest question in the United States. For example, as a foreign service officer working in the United States, I worked in the White House of President Bill Clinton, and then I worked in the White House of President George Bush. You know, two different parties, two different kinds of ideologies, but unity of purpose, unity of belief in America, and unity of trying to make sure that we are based on the reasonable expectations of what Americans want. So yes, that, that is not a myth. We really did have that. And we have lost much of that in our domestic debate, uh, precisely for the reasons that you talk about. I don't know that social media caused it, but it certainly is widening the gap and making it clear that, for example, many people who had friends who were Democrats and Republicans have fewer friends on other side of the, of the divide, which makes our policies harder harder to work. So I, th I think you're onto an important point. My only answer is that I'm not sure that going to an authoritarian system is the way to deal with the inevitable t rise of technology. N no one's going to stop the internet. No one is going to stop social media. The question is, how are you going to cope with it? Are you going to yeah. cope with it by clamping down? Or are you going to cope with it by struggling your way through and trying to figure out through agreed ways of regulation agreed ways of trying to figure out how to deal with this, can you make your way through? It's sloppy, it's not elegant, but I can't see any other way. I certainly can't see the authoritarian way controlling what uh, is, uh, it's a, as we say, a genie you can't put back in the bottle. Right, makes sense. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask you, what was the number one most important thing uh, for the American government or America as a state 
uh, when they look outwards, when in exclusively for foreign policy. A lot of times, you know, we talked about, or we heard democracy, or we heard human rights, or we heard a lot of these mm-hmm. uh, sort of singular um, thought processes or, or statements. Recently, we don't understand, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what, what exactly is the United States thinking in terms of, uh, you know, what do they stand for? Uh, what, in your opinion, is that one thing? Well, one of the great things about being an American diplomat is that you are uh, you are not only representing your state interests, but you are claiming to represent universal interests. Uh, I was often accused of being hypocritical in that way because you're not only talking about universal interests or values, but you're talking about interests. So we talk about women in society, and then we give assistance to Saudi Arabia where there might be one could argue there are difficulties with women in society, right? Right. So these contradictions were built into being an American diplomat. You did interests, you did values. And I thought that the tension between those two was what made us interesting. If you want to be just a guy who does interests, there's plenty of other countries who will go out there and say, you know, we're just here because a country X wants us to be here. No. Now, the problem was that if you are, if you are as you said, generally unified at home, about the context, you can afford to be accused of hypocrisy and naivety because you are strong enough and proud enough to say, we admit our problems. We're talking with you about, for example, uh, difficulties uh, in human rights in Pakistan, and we're admitting we have the same problems at home. The difficulty that we've run into in recent years and uh, the, the, the phenomenon that's going on now with our two political parties is that we are having difficulty living up to our own standards. It's very difficult now for blue states or for Democrats to see in what the Republicans are doing uh, the vision of the America they want to see. And I think the same is true for the Republicans. So if you're a foreigner, I'm not surprised if you're a little confused. We're saying the same things because we still fundamentally believe in human rights. We still believe in American state interests, but they're not coming together. The two parts of the United States are not coming together coherently enough that you're going to get the kind of unified message, even though it's built in contradiction of the values and the interests, you're not going to get the unified message backed by the country that you had before. I tend to be fairly uh, optimistic that in the longer run, we're going to get through this. There's a recent book that was written in the United States called The Storm Before the Calm, which talks about going through this process uh, and that we're going to go through economic, social, other kinds of processes before we come out of this uh, uh, demography, demography, etc. But in the meantime, uh, the best answer I have for you is that we are going to stick to the same kind of language, but smart foreigners are going to say your language doesn't represent what it represented before. And the only thing I can say to you is, you're right. Right. Um, in the in Pakistani context, when I look at the best years of Pakistan-U.S. relationship, it it, it seems like they're generally from uh, the you know when 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 military dictators were were ruling Pakistan. And so again, there is that contradiction of authoritarianism. Uh, you know, where when we had an authoritarian government, it seemed like we were closest to the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of people, a lot of pro-democracy democracy people in Pakistan, you know, when they look at uh, the way that the U.S. supported authoritarian governments in Pakistan, uh, they get a little disappointed, but they also sort of learn from it and, and realize that a lot of those decisions ended up impacting the Pakistani society and overall the region very poorly, uh, you know, over the last few decades. When we look at what's happening in India, for example, right now, it seems like the U.S. is making the same mistake, except, you know, the previously it was Russia, now it's China. Um, where you have an authority, essentially an authoritarian government with a with a particular ideology, which you know some call it a Hindutva ideology, um, that is very slowly but very uh, you know f- I mean a very focused way is subjugating minorities. It's it's taking away a lot of the values that secular India was you know was definitely rightly so celebrated for, um, and obviously with the with the U.S. partnership and the U.S. with uh, at uh, with, you know on its back. Um, they're able to do it in a much more sort of proud manner and, and, and in a much faster manner. Um, do you think the U.S. can use its relationship, um, first of all, to, to, to leverage its relationship to, you know, make India revert to its more secular and more sort of uh, human rights, pro-human rights ways? And secondly, do you think 
the US is potentially making that same mistake of supporting an authoritarian government uh, as long as the means to an end are complete, even though that might just devastate not just that country, but the region uh, as a whole. You make a very good point. And I think starting with the Pakistani example, there's always the back and forth that has been the the oscillation, the, the change in the U.S.-Pakistani relationship that uh, the authoritarians that we supported were always surprised when we would raise foreign uh, human rights. And then when we dealt with such governments as in the 1970s, you know, you know, Zulfika Ali Bhutto or, the, uh, or, or the, the, gov- the civilian governments of the 1990s, they were always surprised when we would do this as well. That is to say, the... The Americans may seem to have been more satisfied with the military rulers, but we were actually making all of them uncomfortable throughout, right? This then, when you look at India, I share your concern that America is choosing at this point to emphasize India as a potential friend, a potential market, a potential geostrategic friend. And not to continue as much as it should to say, and at the same time, we're concerned about these issues. We do say these things, but we're saying them, in my opinion, a little more quietly than we should. Um, uh, If you talk to the Indian government, you will see that the Indian government is sometimes uh, horrified that the Americans are raising things like the questions about citizenship and the the status uh, of minority groups in India and the and the Indian government will be upset and say, you know, we, we thought you liked us. Yeah, we like you, but we also see this problem. So it's not that we don't raise it, but in my personal opinion, we should be very, very uh, uh, even-handed and careful as much as we can be. That said, I th- what I hope is that a certain American style uh, will return, and the style will be that America leads more by example than by anything else. And it's harder for America to be uh, coming down hard on a country about human rights when there are so many things in the United States that are still undecided. And so I think that we're going through a period now of trying to sort out some of the domestic issues, whether it's race, whether it's, again, the income inequality whether it's uh, you know other kinds of constitutional issues. We will be stronger in our support of human rights if we are stronger in our support of our own reform. It's obvious. Both our friends and our enemies say this, but it's obvious. When we get our act together, we will be better and more credible as a country that, that, that criticizes. And, you know, I would say that my relationship with Pakistani leaders when I was here was that they understood that when I went in and gave a message uh, about an issue that we identified as a human rights uh, uh, violation, I didn't do it uh, in contempt. I did it because I care about Pakistan. And if we are credible in doing it, in giving the kind of criticism that is constructive criticism, uh, then I think that kind of thing is healthy. America needs to get back to doing this better, but I think it's going to remain part of American discussion. You may be in for a couple of confusing years, but I think it's going to sort out at the end. Right. Uh, I'm going to sort of wrap this up, but this is a question that I generally ask all mm-hmm. of my guests. And, you know, you've been in and, out, in and out of Pakistan for well over a decade. You were here in some of the most turbulent times, 2010 to 2012. Yes. Um, you know, you've seen Pakistan very closely and particularly the region very closely. If I were to ask you, how do you see Pakistan, you know, based on what you see in the, the way that the situation is evolving, how do you see Pakistan uh, 30 years from now? 30 years from now. Well, I like to think that the things that I'm working on are the things that are going to be uh, planted in the future and will bloom. Let me give you two examples. I'm on the board of governors of the Habib University in Karachi, where we are working to try not only to develop a liberal arts education, which is the idea that is going to be so important for the growth of uh, Pakistan, indeed any country, in the next time, and we're making this education available to uh, underprivileged people. Uh, and uh, this is the experiment with the Habib University. I think that this kind of work is going to make a difference. Secondly, I'm on the board of, of an American company called Care Cloud that uh, employs 3,000 Pakistanis. Uh, 
and works in the tech and and uh, healthcare industry. And I think that this kind of relationship, whether through business, uh, through through universities, is going to be increasingly part of the identity of where Pakistan goes. Now, there is a great danger that this can be choked off. That is to say, the good um, the good tendency I see towards towards uh, making use of Pakistan's talent has to be matched by uh, serious reform. Your parliament, uh, you know, it's not for me to tell them what they do, but, you know, there, there, there is serious need for your parliament to address questions just as simple as your taxation system, just as simple as that, I mean, and many other things. So when I say, where will we be 30 years from now? If the plants that I give you the examples of, if these flowers are able to bloom, your universities, your businesses, your tech sector, all these kinds of things, you're going to be a, a, a significant surprise for all the people who have put Pakistan off in a corner. But that won't happen unless there are some very uh, significant changes in regulation and in self-governance that uh, your, your, your government, your, your, your elected officials have not chosen to address yet. So it could mean that the picture that many people have of Pakistan is a country that you know, in 1960, the South Koreans were coming to you to get advice. You know, even the Chinese were coming to you in the 1980s to get advice on how to reform. And then you fell behind all these countries. This is the, the image of Pakistan. It could still happen that you fall further behind. I don't think so. I think that if we focus, and this is why I agree with the geoeconomic approach, if we focus on the economic, domestic power of this country, and that you become a force for peace in the region, not because you have nuclear weapons, but because you're a trading partner, because you're a place of investment, because your higher education is admired. These kinds of things will make Pakistan into an extraordinary regional power, but not measured geopolitically, measured geoeconomically. So in this sense, I very much agree with that approach, and I hope that at the working level, we'll make that happen. Sounds good, sir. Thank you so much for, for you know taking the time out and sharing all this uh, insight. And I hope you have a great time in Pakistan. I sure will. Thank you. And for all of you, all of you guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends. Uh, please like the video on YouTube. It'll increase engagement and, and you know reach more people. Uh, if you like this conversation and want more, please do subscribe on the channel. And we'll have a new conversation every Tuesday and Thursday. But anyways, this was Sayyid Mazam Lesson Zaidi. You are watching the Pakistan Pivot. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.